The scripture reading for session two will be taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 89, verses 19 to 37. Verse 19. Of old, you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil. I have anointed him, so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever and my covenant I will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever, and his throne as the days of the heavens. If his children forsake my law, and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes, and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod, and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love, or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness. I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever. A faithful witness in the skies. This is the word of the Lord. I now pass the time to the camp speaker to bring us tonight's message. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Elsie. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. You can hear me loud and clear? Yes? Yeah, wonderful. Yes. Okay, great. Right, tonight we begin uh, session two. Let me check the clock. I must make sure I finish on time. Okay, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Okay, Father, we want to thank you for this evening. I want to thank you, Lord, for the faithful ones who are coming to hear your word. And I pray, O oh Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would you make your word clear? And would it rest in their hearts, Lord, burning in their hearts that they may desire you more and more to pursue you, to love you, to chase after you, O oh God, the Almighty One, the Beautiful One, the Faithful One. Lord, you are good the just one. So Lord, we just want to pray, Holy Spirit, even though we are tired, Lord, we just want to pray that you will refresh us and keep our ears and our eyes and our hearts open to hear you. And we pr I pray also, Lord, that you will help us, that our, internets, uh, will, our internet service will be uh, stable so that everyone can enjoy and be filled with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right. Thank you again. Uh, let me just get this. Okay, today we will carry on. Thank you, Joshua, for, for the lovely um, scripture reading. We will be, uh, I will be running through Psalm 89, um, 19 to 37, and we will refer to the English Standard Version. Now, let's start with verse 19. Of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one, and I said, I have granted help to one who is mighty, I have exalted one chosen from the people. So this time, Ethan shifts gear a bit. Now he is now not talking about him praising God. He is referring to something that God has said. So you see a lot of I will, I have. So this is God speaking. Now what happened was, in if you, if you read 2 Samuel chapter 7, God gave, uh, came to Nathan the prophet with uh, in, in a vision uh, to tell him of his um, covenant that he's blessing that he's going to give David okay so you see from here that God is now saying so so Ethan is re, uh, retelling the the covenant that God gave what was the promise that God gave so now David this uh, okay 
well, uh, Charles Spurgeon says probably the godly one may not be David. It could be um, Nathan. Uh, yeah, but most people will probably say and we think that it refers directly to David because this was the blessing for David. Now, when uh, in, in this verse, you will say, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. Now, David himself was not from an influential family. In fact, when we first come across David, he was a little boy with a sheep. And when Samuel came, even the father didn't invite him because he was just too little. He was far out in some field somewhere. But God told Samuel to go, you know, get that boy. So even from that far out, God chose him, right? God elected him and God called him his servant, right? So, uh, so David was chosen from the people. So again, this psalm has got messianic implications as well. It is a messianic psalm because it refers to Jesus. There are lots of similarities to Jesus because Jesus was also extracted from the people okay he came from the people uh, jesus came from from heaven but when he was birthed he didn't he, he wasn't birthed in a royal family he didn't get you know satin sheets for his uh, you know for uh, when he was born he was in a manger with a lot of animals you know it was a very lowly birth among poor people and jesus was elected by god from among the people he was extracted from there he was elected from there and Jesus was exalted above the people. Even though Jesus was hidden uh, once, you know, as a refugee in Egypt when he came back. So he, uh, you know, uh, lived in Nazareth for a long time. Nazareth is not known to be a very famous place. In fact, some Ulu Kampong somewhere hidden down there. And yet God took him out and raised him up. So he was exalted also above the people. Okay. Now, I will now go into uh, verses 20 to 24. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him. Okay, so we know. Who is the I have? God. So God anointed David. So more important than any other crown or any other, you know, you could say famous things that you would probably want to achieve, something more influential, more powerful, is the fact that God himself anointed you. So in this case, David was anointed by God set apart for a sacred office and this is also similar to jesus because jesus was set apart to be the messiah the christ for us and when you read through 21 to 24 as well you will see that the similarities are, are with a psalm 2. now psalm 2 is a messianic psalm as well it refers to you know jesus coming and, and jesus having power he's the son of god right? and, and he calls god father so let's 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 uh Go to 21. So that my hand will be established with him, my arm shall also strengthen him. The enemy shall not, not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes. You, know, you, you can just see Psalm 2 here. Yeah, I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love will, shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. Right? So... This is the Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed has got full authority over all enemies. They might try to resist, but you know they, they are just crushed. So the real source, in this case, because Ethan doesn't know that he's actually writing a prophetic psalm. Ethan was thinking only of David. So the real source of David's power then was still very much in God, the God of Israel, in God's very presence and God's very purpose for him and his descendants. Because when we look forward, even though David went through a lot of hassle, went through a lot of you know, turmoil, he was never overthrown. He finally conquered every enemy, whether it was Saul who wanted to stop him from being king, or even his own son from trying to you know, revolt against the father, or from the conspiracy of a man called Sheba, or even after his death, the house of Saul uh, tried to uh, get back their throne. Okay, so all these things, the enemies continued to fight against, uh, you know, the uh, uh, David's authority over uh, and his kingship uh, over uh, Israel. But he never succeeded. All those people never succeeded. God protected the throne of David. Okay, so let's move on. Now, verse 25, I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. 
he shall cry to me you are my father my god and the rock of my salvation and a very much of psalm 2 here and i will make him the firstborn the highest of the kings of the earth so we see that you know god uh, is blessing david that he will have you know control dominion from the sea to the rivers the land everywhere and david will call him father all right but when we look at it we see the perfect today we are in this new covenant we see the perfect fulfillment of this dominion by the greater son who is jesus christ our lord okay so we see also that jesus calls abba father uh, god the father very true of uh, jesus the messiah and when we look at verse 27 it says i will make him the firstborn now we all know what is firstborn firstborn means elders right but we know that david was the youngest in his family <clears throat> so so god is saying you can be born physically as the youngest but i will make you firstborn now the word firstborn carries a lot of blessing because it gives you prominence you get double the blessing double the favor that is accorded to the firstborn so god made uh, david gave, gave him a special position that he would be the firstborn in his sight and this only god can do that but for us our firstborn is jesus christ because jesus is the firstborn of the resurrection double blessing great blessing and he is our highest of kings on the earth so we have the advantage of looking from the lenses of the new testament yeah okay so god was merciful to david's house also because he god had a big plan now now we don't we don't see i'm sure ethan never saw forward he couldn't see forward but now we are a very blessed generation we can look backward and say wow god had planned all these things from the very beginning so when he gave this uh you know this blessing over uh, David's descendants, God actually had in mind Jesus Christ. Yeah, so we can see that such a great blessing. Okay, let's look at 28. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. Now, we see one thing, my covenant shall stand firm. Now, God himself is making a legal document, a legal promise, all right? And he intends to stand by it. This is crazy. You know why? You know, because usually, like, you know, in a normal legal document, those of us who have seen contracts, uh, usually contracts, uh, they protect the person. You know, if let's say I'm making a contract with somebody, I'll make sure, you know, that I put in something that will protect myself. And we always have this joke about looking at the fine print. Not even a joke, it's reality. So we look at the fine print inside the contract. Hey, you know, got anything that, you know, they all put inside that to make sure that they don't pay us or something like that. But God, in this case, he makes a legal document of love, all right? But he holds himself to it. There's no way he intends to run away from it. He locks himself in. So where can you find this kind of person? Honestly, who are you, God, you know, that you would be so generous with your love that you will give and tie yourself to this covenant. It will stand firm, all right? So this is the promise from this Davidic covenant. We call it in Second Samuel chapter 7. This Ethan is actually like repeating it. Huh? <clears throat> and we know that the actual covenant was fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is like a forever covenant, right? forever. And Jesus is the, you know, the king in this Davidic line. Now, we, we see God's character here very clearly. God, God himself commits himself very lavishly in love over the one that he has chosen. He chose David at that point in that particular covenant. All right. And when we look forward, we look at Ephesians chapter 1. You know, I, I love this verse, seven, verse 17 to 18. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Now, God is God, you know. He is so great. His, his mind is greater than ours. We wouldn't have known. And in Ethan's time, he was the wisest of men. He would have known right, what God was planning to do. But, you know, even today, we are being so blessed by this lavishing, you know, when you lavish, it means you, you give beyond 
overflow of love because he will establish his offspring offspring <laughs> my, my teeth getting into the way. offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens so what we see here right god is promising that he's going to complete this deal right he's going to fulfill it and he's not going to you know ex extricate himself from it so when you read this whole thing through you see a lot of i have i have i have what is god actually doing god is actually blessing david and his future descendants right and this is the description god is blessing him with his help divine help god is blessing him with he's going to exalt him he says, i will lift you up i have exalted i have lifted him up you don't have to try to be famous i will make you famous i will lift you up the blessing of election god chose him all right chosen from the people the blessing of anointing god himself chose him anoints him right okay and that is like you know you're you're being given a special uh, purpose a, a sacred office the blessing of security my hand shall be established with whom my hand shall be established god promises him his security god pro promises him what his own strength my arm shall strengthen him it's not your own strength my arm all right god's talking about his arm what else because why why would god you know overflow with so many blessings for david because we we know that in scripture god calls david the man after his own heart now david was not perfect we all are all not perfect david sinned we all sin as well but god in his grace right elected him selected him and even called him a man after my own heart imagine my little young brothers and sisters the older ones as well imagine how you would feel if god calls you a woman after my own heart or a man after my own heart isn't that beautiful and god promises this sort of blessing over us because now because of what jesus has done we are now adopted as his sons we are adopted we are heirs so we actually have all these blessings with us and how come we don't seem to realize it you know this blessing this over oh this overflowing of grace to us what else the blessing of protection the enemy cannot outwit us the son of wickedness cannot afflict us the blessing of vindication what does that mean when people accuse you god himself will vindicate you god will beat down your foes god will even plague those who hate you right okay so that was for david the blessing of ongoing faithfulness and mercy not only for your own life but can you imagine if you're a parent and you pray that you ask god god would you bless my descendants and god says yes it's yours imagine that the blessing of ongoing faithfulness from god for your future generations for your children and the blessing of exalted strength you're going to have extra strength uh, in my name his horn shall be exalted don't you think we have a wonderful wonderful god okay so let's go now to uh verse 30 all right okay we haven't finished yeah so this is a this is the second part of the praises now in any covenant in any legal document there will be certain terms and conditions all right so here there is this clause now god is just saying now if david's children were to forsake my law and don't follow my rules if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments so this is where you come about talk about god as judge god in his righteousness all right god in his justice there are laws there are rules there are statutes there are commandments okay what will god do i will punish their transgression with what the rod and their iniquity with stripes oh you're gonna get the rotan you're gonna get nice whipping okay but i will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness imagine that you know what god is not going to destroy them there are certain people groups that you know they were so wicked that god had to destroy them but god says i will correct them i will bring the cane yeah and i'm sure some of you have, have tasted the rotan before painful but god says no i will not remove from him my steadfast love 
all be false in my faithfulness. Wow. This is the Hesed, the covenant love. God commits himself that he will continue to stay faithful even though his children are unfaithful, but he will not uh, he will not spare the rod. Okay? One thing God says, I will not violate my covenant or alter the word. Wow. I will not violate my covenant. So God says, I'm keeping it. I'm not asking you to keep it. It's mine. So God commits himself to us through this legal document. He's pledging his whole self into this covenant. All of himself. He will not alter any word that comes out from him. Once for all, I have sworn my holiness. I will not lie to David. Oh my goodness. Can God lie? No, we know that God cannot lie. But can you imagine God, yeah, God saying that I will not lie to David? Now we know that in Jesus, this covenant is ratified, all right, both by his blood, which was sacrificed, and by this covenant as well, flows right through. This promise, this, this promise is, is like a legal document, will never be cancelled or altered, right? So Spurgeon is saying, can you imagine, this promise is built from someone who cannot lie. All right, okay, let's move on. So here, God is pledging the crown of his kingdom, the excellent beauty of his person, the essence of his nature, onto a people very undeserving, us. All right, his descendants, it's actually built on only David, right? But God is saying, I pledge myself to this line because Jesus is going to be the one who's going to carry this. God is actually saying this, you know, if ever I were to not honor this contract, it is as good as I am not holy. Of course, we know that it's not possible because God is holy. He cannot forfeit his holy character, right? So God is saying, as constant as the sun and the moon, as constant as that, there are faithful witnesses in the sky. This is as constant as my love for you, as constant as my promise to you. Wow. Don't you think it is beautiful, so splendid, so glorious? God, what are you doing to us? You know, and, and David at that point when he heard it, he's like, what did I do to deserve this? Exactly was his reaction. What did I do to deserve this? And this should be our reaction too. When we hear the good news of the gospel, we should be also in the same position. <gasps> what did we do to deserve this? Nothing. It is not because we deserve it. It's because of who God is. He commits himself to that lavish love. So much so, he's willing to sacrifice himself for us. That is the extent of love. And it is from infinity to infinity. How can you even measure that? Right? Okay? And it's being given to us. Okay? So Spurgeon said this. What more can God say? Really, you know, how can someone love you so much? What more can God say? In what stronger language can he express his unalterable adherence to the truth of his promise? This is God's promise, and th there is no other language he can actually say, right? Beyond this, like, we are, I, and you're just sitting there. You know, when I was preparing Psalm 89 for you all, I couldn't move, you know. I was like, oh, I'm just so in awe. This is, you know, this is just so beautiful. This is just so amazing, you know. Okay, now coming back to what we talked about, <clears throat> righteousness and justice, because that is the throne, the foundation of God's throne. What does it say about God Himself? God cannot lie; He's truth. Steadfastness, uh, steadfast love, and faithfulness go before you. I said that I promised you I was going to go deeper into this. Now we look at this picture, you know, just now when I was just um, trying to get a picture for this particular slide, immediately I just typed in righteousness, <coughs> typed it in. What do I get? Boop, came out, river. I was like, oh, wow. Even, you know, a secular website can tell you that righteousness is like a river, an ever-flowing street. Immediately it came out, Amos 5.24. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. 
Now, if ever we have to split these two up, I would say this. Justice is like our action. When we act justly, all right, the more we act justly, the more the river will flow smoothly. The river will continue to flow when there is justice, right? So God himself is judge, and God himself is the one who works justice because by his character, he is righteous. How do we even describe God? I was struggling. How do we describe the beauty of God you know, in 40 minutes? I was like, okay, perhaps we could use a picture of a diamond. What is the essence of the diamond, we ask ourselves? Okay, there are facets to the diamond which makes the diamond shine so beautifully. It's, 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 very, it's glorious when we look at it. So imagine you're watching a movie and you're, you know, like you're Indiana Jones and you're running towards the diamond and you're trying to grab it. But the moment you try, you get near it, what happens? You get struck by it and you die. Okay? So in that sense, God's holiness is like this story of this diamond that, you know, you can't get close to. Because God is holy, his Shekinah glory, the moment you even try to even get near it, don't talk about touching it, get near it, we will die. He is so beautiful and he is holy. That means to say he is the benchmark of everything that is good and right. Okay? Okay, how do I explain this? Like yesterday, I, I mentioned it a little. He is like the ruler. Now, if I had to draw a straight line, if I have to draw a, a straight line, I would need a ruler to draw that straight line. He is like that ruler. Or a plumb line. If I were to build something, I need a plumb line to tell me how straight and how, you know, how straight is the building. Is it crooked or not? Or, you know, how, how does it go? So here we are trying to explain God's essence. God is holy. And yet the multiple facets of God is that, you know, in that holiness, right, his nature, his character, he, he, his nature is righteous. He is our judge because justice is him. He is, he, he is the standard for what is right. He, therefore, he can judge. And when he judges, he judges fairly and equitably. He is the one who gives the law because he is righteous. Only he can give the law that will give life. And he is also our king who deserves our uh, uh, reverence, you know. Uh, and he is the one who is also our savior. We get this in Isaiah 33, 22. Now, how beautiful is this? So we're trying to say, okay, in understanding divine righteousness, now Ethan declares in, uh, in Psalm 89, 14, about righteousness and justice as the throne all right, of our God. It is Zedek and Mishpat. They are the foundation of God's throne. God himself, that means God himself is right, he is just, he is truth, that he is the standard for everything that is right, everything that is just, and everything that is truth. So righteousness is the very essence of who he is, is essential in him. The essence means that the word essential is very part of his very being, right? And it characterizes everything that he does. So justice is an extension of, of what he does as a result of him being righteous. So God is morally and ethically right. He is that standard. So whatever is just will be his, uh, his standard of justice. And you find this theme right through scripture. One day, you know what you can do is you take a holiday and you just open up your scripture right from Genesis to Revelation. All you do is look for the words justice judge you look for uh, righteousness and I'm sure you're gonna find it right across scripture our God is righteous now so somebody can ask then can you find can you find uh, you know justice without faith no because the question really is do we even have faith that this God exists that this God this wonderful loving God he is real to us. Now, I'm not addressing somebody who's not a Christian. I'm addressing those of us who call ourselves Christians. 
how how do we come to all these truths? Because it affects how we live, correct? Right? Our lifestyle. Okay? Because if God does what is right and his spirit lives within us, automatically, I don't have to tell you, be just. In your heart, you are automatically totally, you know, looking to ju doing justice and you are righteous because God has put his spirit in you. So you would want to be benchmarked and you bear that standard of righteousness. So our response when we pray rests on that, our faith on this God, his character, his nature, that he is righteous. So because in this world, we've got so much of injustice. So when we come to this part, we say, okay, does this God exist? Because there's so much of injustice. God, are you really just? Are you there? Okay, so God's righteousness is the ethical dimension of his holiness. God is holy, right? So it is that aspect of his holiness which distinguish, distinguishes him as consistent from his own moral demands. And so God can make demands of us because of who he is. We were sinners before, but God is not going to accept that unholiness. God wants us to be like him. All right, because we have to be in his presence. Okay, so he determines what is right and wrong. And scripture affirms that God is righteous. He is right. And he always conforms to himself. He glorifies himself. And he will faithfully adhere to his own perfection. So God's highest principle of uh, justice is actually himself. Because by very nature, God is perfect. God is holy. So he is the definitive. He sets the standard of all things that are just. So when we talk about justice and mercy, these are expressions of the righteousness that is in God and that is the basis of the truth. All right? Okay? So righteousness consists in glorifying God and nothing else. Now these are not, when we say, oh, it sounds so very abstract. Actually, it's not. You all know right and wrong. Okay? So when we say right and wrong, you might say that is wrong. I might say that is wrong. But with God, He is the standard. Uh, he, God will say, no, that is wrong. Okay? And especially when we read Sermon on the Mount, we see what Jesus says about what He thinks is adultery, for example. Right? And He tells you what is really right. So He sets a higher standard, but that's God's standard. So that is righteousness. So that's why people say, if you really want to live out a righteous life, you just have to really look at the Sermon on the Mount and live it. But we can't. We all know we can't. Because why? We are human beings and we are prone to sin. But because the Holy Spirit lives in us, He will supernaturally bring us and God intends to bring us to that perfection. That is His promise. So that's a wonderful thing. God will always remain faithful. And Paul you know, tells us about that. God will always preserve and display the glory of his name. So, for, uh, God is ever concerned to glorify himself in everything that he does. And his righteousness all right, is the one that tells us that. So, that is the standard that God is telling us. Okay? Now, so if I were to draw you know, maybe an example. So, righteousness is who God is. And God's justice is his act. Of righteousness because he is going to bring judgment and we know that Jesus when he returns is going to bring final judgment right on all the injustices that we have experienced and the world is experiencing so that would be justice the act of judgment bringing true justice to the world and with that justice also brings mercy God's righteousness comes with mercy now in our, our uh, physical realm Whenever we talk about justice, we don't talk about mercy. Justice is, okay, you stole, whether you steal a Milo or you stole, you know, uh, two billion bucks, you know, this is the number of years you got to sit in jail, for example. All right? So there is no sense of equity. You know, this person stole the Milo because the children were very sick and, you know, they, had, they were very poor. You know, the judge doesn't listen to all that. He just goes like, okay, did you steal or not? Full stop. But with God, there is mercy. And we are thankful for that because we are all sinners. We don't deserve mercy. We actually deserve justice. We deserve to be judged. 
but God's justice is perfect because it includes mercy. We always sing of songs of grace and mercy. It is because of His amazing grace to us that He's willing to forgive us. But there is a cost, and that is why Jesus took the judgment for us. There is a cost. We cannot run away from the fact that we need judgment. Okay, that's why when we when when uh, even in First Peter, uh, one sixteen, when God says, "You shall be holy, for I am holy," that is the benchmark. So holiness includes righteousness. All right, everything bow sign. We all in Canada, everything tap out. All right, your holiness includes righteousness. So we cannot say, "Uh, today I don't feel like doing this justice thing. I don't feel like doing that," because we us, if we are holy. Every bit of us acts out in one thing. You know what that is? Love. You notice one thing that comes right through the psalm. God, God being righteous, God being holy, you know, God being uh, just. Everything comes out to one thing. God loves so lavishly, and because God loves so lavishly, we too, because the essence of us within us lives the Holy Spirit. Are supposed to love lavishly as well, so when we do acts of justice, so this is an extension of that love that God has for people and uses our hands and our feet to act out and help these people. Okay, so what would be religion that is not, uh, you know, not out of faith? What is not true religion then? Now you see in Isaiah. Chapter one, verses thirteen to seven. Actually, the whole of chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter one is amazing. When you read it, God actually says this: you know, uh, please don't don't send me all this solemn assembly la, worship la, convocation la. My soul hates. You know, verse forty. My soul hates that. You're a burden to me. Okay. Enough of your praying. Means enough of all this piety. You know, all this uh, external action. But your hearts are so far away. From From me, what did God say in verse seventeen? What does He want? Go and learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Sometimes people ask you, you know, what do I need to do? I say, then、yeah, go back to the Bible. God is very clear. Don't sit in church and just have prayer meetings only and pray, you know. But the prayer must come with what action. Learn to do good. Next one. Okay, Isaiah fifty-eight. Oh, my favorite, right? Isaiah fifty-eight about true fasting. What is true religion that God wants? Right? These people they say, oh, we want to look for you, oh God. When you look at the third line, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. Is God speaking? You know, they seek me daily, every day. Wow, we are very good. We pray one hour. Tick. Okay. We want to draw near to God. Tick. We even fast and pray. Tick. You know. We humble ourselves, God. How come you never answer our prayers? But what did God say? On the day you fast, what did you do? You do it out of your own pleasure. You know, there's a difference between fasting and dieting. You know, people diet to lose weight, to look good, so it's for their own pleasure. But they call it fasting as if it's very religious. Actually, they don't love God that much. What do they do? They oppress workers. Huh? God is concerned about our acts of righteousness, which is just. Are we doing things which are just to the workers? Okay, behold, you fast only to what quarrel and fight. Look at the amount of quarreling and fighting in church. Ah, enough, no. You know how you know there was once I went to this place. Now it's a it's a it's a big town. I went there. I said, wow! I thought you know there must be revival. Like every corner of that town, uh, got church one. You know, so I said, wow! Revival happening in this place. Ah,、uh, fantastic man. Then the pastor told me, no lah. This fellow quarrel with that fellow. That fellow quarrel with this fellow. So he left and started a new church. I said, eh,、hey, chair. You know, but that is the reality. Instead of us as a family loving one another, we quarrel and fight, and then we start another new church. And then God can see through that. And then worse still, the physical hit with a wicked fist. Now we get we we nowadays ah、uh, when we are angry, we go on the, on the Facebook ah、uh, or go online Twitter. Wow, whack 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 whack. You know the amount of hate. So what's the point of fasting? Okay, all right. Now. What is true religion? And this is very scary.、It、comes direct from Jesus. What is true religion then? True religion, as far as Jesus is concerned, he says, "And I will declare to them, I never knew you." That's pretty scary. 
because these people were prophesying in Jesus name and this is talking for Jesus knows that uh, there are people who are doing uh, you know doing church they prophesy in Jesus name they cast out demons in Jesus name they do mighty works in Jesus name but what is Jesus concerned with do you know him and does he know you so true religion is really knowing Jesus and being known by him full stop very simple two line one whole line only but that is where I want to challenge all of you to really go deep into the Word of God and really seek to pursue and know Jesus life will be so different when you start to realize that and you see the Holy Spirit working in you and when Jesus said follow me you will understand the cost of discipleship that is the true test okay so if not you're just playing church okay so this is for all of us Christians you know I always remind myself am I playing church or am I doing what Jesus is telling me do I know Jesus does Jesus know me or not okay Micah 6 8 the famous Micah 6 8 I love this because here you know I, I'm very thankful sir, for Psalm 89 because Micah 6 8 just completely blooms when I look at some from the from the lenses of Psalm 89 it says what does uh, what does God require of us to do justly <coughs> love mercy <coughs> and walk humbly with God see justly to do you, just, you start to realize that we need to do just acts this is this is justice is an action act justly love mercy is really from the heart that gentleness that loveliness you know that compassion merciful and there, there are many versions uh, and there are many descriptions of mercy that was from NKJV and NIV ESV has it as love kindness I think kind, mercy is bigger than kindness we call it steadfast love but whatever it is mercy and it, it encapsulates love love for people who don't deserve it perhaps but you need to love these people be merciful to them and to walk humbly with God okay so look at that <clears throat> everything comes alive now back to the issue the thing about love anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. so encapsulating all this is what Jesus taught us also what John says that God is love so God's love is the very essence of his holiness and righteousness and justice are all the extensions of his character if we do love then we will do righteously and we will love to do justice okay so how then do we identify cultures and systems of injustice I love this verse I love Romans chapter 118 what does the Bible say about this what is unrighteousness now God will judge the world so this is where I talk about justice judgment is coming God's wrath is coming how is it it's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth I'm like those three words suppress the truth is enough for me to be able to dis discern and uncover which are the cultures and systems of injustice we see that in a capitalistic system there's economic injustice we see that in political systems where the freedom of belief is not allowed we see that in our own country where the legal system is being used to suppress the truth of the gospel now that God calls it unrighteousness complete rebellion against him now today even in the West even in Europe if you I remember there was this uh, member of Parliament she mentioned uh, uh, a verse uh, in the Bible on homosexuality and now they want to put her in jail imagine the, the the shift in culture you know and the systems of injustice and when this you know, the truth of the gospel is there, and also the truth of what God says because God loves man and we are all made in the image of God and God loves us so people who are being oppressed they you know and you know, for example I tell you you know like in India the church started to work among the Dalits. Now the, the caste system, India has a caste system. 
and the Dalits are right at the bottom. Maybe they are maybe get to you know uh, wash toilets or but basically they don't get education. They don't get anything. You know they are the worst. So in their their in their country, the cultural system also. So not just capital six system, not just political system, but cultural system. The culture of that society allows them to have downtrodden people. Okay, so the Dalits were at the bottom. What happened was the church came in, missionaries came in, and gave them education, and gave them Christ, and that started the transformation of these people, who now can actually read and write, and not just that, hold important jobs. Now, but that has actually completely, you know, messed up their cultural system, and that is why you find the world's system will continue to fight against the gospel because they don't like it. They don't like the fact that the Dalits are coming up and they blame the church. Okay, so this is what we will see. So when uh, you know all of this will require you know another one hour, or two hours in the proper seminar. We talk about cultures and systems of injustice, but it is enough for us to see how. Paul actually defines unrighteousness in the society when they suppress the truth. Okay, now I just wanted to yeah, before I end, uh, I just wanted to share with you about what I did. Now um, I got into uh, uh, the council. I was actually appointed. Yeah, I was appointed into Council for World Mission. Many many years ago, at least fifteen years ago, if you look if you look at this about fifteen years ago, because the Accra Confession was built in two zero zero four. So I was appointed there and uh, to be taking care of youth, okay, representing Malaysia, and right there was justice at the heart of faith, and that blew me away, and I was like. Wow, you know, so far normally in church you talk about evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. Very seldom you get into a system where you see your faith coming into the public sphere or in the society where you try to impact society and the culture. So when I was put there, right, uh, that was I think sometime maybe about two zero zero seven, if I'm not mistaken, around two zero zero seven, and I got to go to Taiwan. And I'll tell you about Taiwan tomorrow because we don't have time to do that. Uh, and and here was the theme, and that theme until to date stands, justice at the heart of faith. What do they do? So these are all Christians. They're ecumenical, uh, mainly from the Presbyterian tribe or all the Reformed churches. So you got all the Reformed churches coming together. Uh, so you see from at the bottom if you can read it, World Council of Churches will be there. And the reformed churches where I am part of, so I I was also there as well. So over here, we would uh, my job uh, was actually to focus on things like economic injustice, because a lot of people are made poor, probably because of race, okay, and also because of the capitalistic system, because of education they don't get a chance to study, for example, and also ecological destruction. So that was my sphere, and I was looking from the perspective of youth. Okay, right. So this is an example of Christians setting up something which is global and working on bringing justice into impacting the、uh, demonic cultures of the world. You can say unholy cultures of the world. Right. Okay. So this was me when uh. So when I was in the 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 um. Uh, working with the Council for World Mission on behalf of the Presbyterian Church, so I was also appointed to CCM, which is the Council of Churches of Malaysia, and and、uh, in here since I was already here, so I decided, all right, might as well go and bring this topic here lah, putting justice at the house of、uh, at at the heart of faith, and that was in two zero zero nine when we had our first Christian Youth Leaders Assembly because I was in charge of youth. And just by the way, be very careful how you pray to God. I know that God answers my prayer, because I said something to God. It was like, <clears throat> Lord, I was actually very frustrated in church because I was sitting at the at NP and I was listening to the pastor going, "Come, let's pray for Malaysia," and I was like, "Oh God, I don't even know how the Malaysian church looks like. I don't even know, you know, what is it about." I don't even know what your will is like for the church. I don't even know how to begin praying. That was what I said to God. You know, I tell you, within three months, 
by some fluke. It's a fluke because I am actually not involved in church. Church. I am actually in the marketplace. Suddenly, I got appointed. I was in charge of youth, and I saw the church for what it was. So I laughed at God. I was like, Ah,、uh, next I'm going to be very careful to,、uh, telling you what I think. But God is very good. So He has really guided me to give me a bigger picture of what He intends to do, what He wants to do. And I'm really loving my journey as well. Of course, it's not easy. There's a lot of hard work, but I did this. So, so your theme is actually something that came from the past, and it continues to be very important because what is the heart of faith? You know, the heart of faith is really Jesus, and Jesus is the judge. He brings justice. Okay, all right. And this was something that I did when I was in CCM youth, taking care of it. So you see, well, the first one. On your just as a, just examples, okay. On the、uh, left hand side from the star,、um, they quoted me,、uh, quoted me、uh, that you know I was against your their anti homeless measures because they're going to grab everybody, get rid of them from KL, not going to feed them. So I say you cannot do that. That's not right. So here I am being a voice. People who may not know me, these homeless people don't know me, but I'm there to just say, have a word, just to speak up. To be a voice of compassion and care, so I use my ability to write. I use my my voice, you know, to just tell, you know, the government this is not what you should be doing. You should do something else. And another one I wrote about was on、um, the economic crisis because you know everybody is affected. That was then. This was as early as two zero zero eight. No, just now when I was, you know, really going and looking for some pictures, I was like, wow, it was so long ago, two zero zero eight. I was talking about. You know the the economy, the stimulus、uh, package, and、uh, it's a very long uh, uh, thing. But it was nice to know that you know that time I was able to put CCM Youth out there as an organization that spoke up for justice for the people of Malaysia. So these are things that we can do, you know. And、uh, I must tell you, it was a journey. And and tomorrow when I got time, I'll tell you the whole journey.